You are listening to Middle East Monitor Conversations, bringing you lively discussions with prominent voices from the region and beyond as we delve deeper into issues shaping the Middle East and North Africa, from politics to culture and the arts. Hello, welcome to a conversation with the Middle East Monitor. My name is Nasim Ahmed. I will be your host for today's conversation. Uh, we are discussing uh, Farha, a movie which many of you will have uh, seen about a 14-year-old Palestinian girl who survives the 1948 uh, Nakba, the Palestinian catastrophe uh, following Israel's ethnic cleansing of Palestine. Uh, the movie premiered at the Toronto Film Festival on 14 September 2021, um, but it didn't really attract global attention and the ire of the Israeli politicians until it began streaming on Netflix at the beginning of this month. Directed by Darin Salam, the movie is based on real life events of the eyewitness account and oral history of a Palestinian girl named uh, Radia. It sparked a lot of discussion and debate, not least about the value of the movie like Farha, uh, discussions about the history, uh, the historical accuracy, uh, and the events depicted in the movie. And of course, the Israeli reaction itself, uh, who seem to be uh, terrified at the Palestinians uh, telling their own stories and accounts of the Anakba. Um, my guest today um, is Dr. Suja Sawafta. Uh, she is the Assistant Professor of Arabic Studies, Modern Languages and Literature at the University of Miami. Welcome to the show, Suja. Thank you for having me again, Nassim. So before we get into the um, movie itself um, and the wider political, cultural significance of the movie, I wanted to ask you, as a Palestinian yourself, how did you feel watching the movie? Well, thank you for asking that question because it's very rare that I get asked how I'm feeling. It's usually if I share an experience, um, say at the LNB bridge or at a checkpoint, with someone who's never experienced that, um, they'll often respond with, well, let me tell you how I understand your experience from my perspective, right? Um, so with that said, I'm really coming to this conversation as a viewer, first and foremost, and second, as a scholar who knows a little bit about, you know, the events behind this. Um, but for me, I felt a combination of um, a sort of visceral reaction. It was very heavy to watch this film. Um, it certainly wasn't easy. My anxiety was up. But at the same time, I found that the experience was also cathartic because for the first time, probably in my lifetime, at least, um, there's a film that depicts the story of displacement and the Nakba and the, the specific, you know, violent events of um, in towns like Tantura, Deir Yassin and Kufur Qasim, which obviously we know as ethnographic accounts and oral histories and in memory, but very rarely have we seen them beyond, let's say, the page extend onto a screen where somebody is telling that for us so or representing it for us. So from that perspective, it was very validating as well. But certainly, um, I would probably say that for most Palestinians, it was you have to go into this film ready for, yeah. for the good and the bad. I would say for everyone, uh, myself included. <laughs> I mean, I, I'm not a Palestinian, but I, I, I of course, uh, write a lot on Palestine and other issues. And me watching it, uh, it was it was quite um, moving, very moving. I mean, you were so moved. I mean, you wrote a piece about it on on the Middle East Monitor, uh, and you said that you know Farha grants the Palestinian diaspora permission to narrate. So talk about that. Uh, talk about that a little bit, you know, uh, and the wider significance of the movie itself. So the, the concept of permission or having permission to narrate was coined by Edward Said in nineteen eighty four. Um, in response to the Israeli invasion of Lebanon in 1982, specifically what's called Hiroshima Day. Uh, and he writes in this, in this piece, which was published by the Journal of Palestine Studies, that Palestinians, by and large, to sum it up, have been denied the permission to narrate their own stories without a significant backlash from governmental and institutional apparatus that are in place to, for lack of a better word, police that narrative. 
Um, and this, the scholarship that he's done, as well as Rabihim Abu Lughud, Rosemary Saig, Rashid Al Khaldi, Noam Chomsky, Elon Pape, has cracked open that conversation. We now have so much more content since the 1980s, um, especially in academia and in the ivory tower and a lot more also novels and um, other kinds of cultural representations that are narrating these histories and these experiences. But it the, the apparatus um, or say the, the structure that punishes people for speaking their truth and their experience still exists. So in a sense, I think that this film val uh, validates the experience of many people, probably the generation of my grandmother's age, um, that we've been hearing, but we've had no, we weren't there, you know, there aside from the archive, which is inaccessible to everybody by nature of it being an archive. Very few uh, people have attempted to fossilize this story in outside of academic work and outside of a few novels that remain by and large untranslated. So still in Arabic, still in circulation in the Palestinian and Pan-Arab sphere, but very rarely do they make them outside? That has since been changing, obviously. But I think, you know, from a technical standpoint, this film narrates a very specific event in history, which about a quarter of a million Palestinians who were expelled will attest to the veracity of that narrative and say, this sounds a lot like what happened to my grandfather or to if those grandparents are still alive to them, right? To their parents. Um, and so that's the point I think that this film really does is that it it provides a representation to a narration that Palestinians know very well, but others might not. Hmm. I mean, I, I, I heard a number of Palestinians saying they actually cried watching the movie because Farha was not really just one individual. They saw Farha as being a manifestation of the 750,000 Palestinians um, who were expelled and they saw themselves in Farha. And mm -hmm. I, I read actually, you know, uh, the, the cried watching the movie. Um, but I wanted to get back to um, uh, Said's quote itself. I think it's quite interesting. I mean, if I can just, um, say the whole quotation which you cited um, before I ask you the, the next question. Said said that, you know, um, that a disciplinary communications apparatus exists in the West, both for overlooking most of the basic things that might present Israel in a bad light and for punishing those who try to tell the truth. Um, I mean, I would say that was that was cited or that was mentioned by Said over four, nearly four decades ago. Um, so in that period, do you think a lot has changed since um, in terms of the ability of the Palestinians to narrate uh, their own story? Yes and no. <laughs> so a lot has changed, I mean, simply to put it simply. Um, I think the first step was the declassification of military archives, whether those are the Zionist archives, the British archives, the UN archives, what have you. We know from a historical perspective, these archives are classified for 30 years, which means that between 1948 and 1978, which is a significant moment in the history of the Israel-Palestine question, these, these archives were classified and therefore inaccessible to the majority of people who were, um, who were wanting to access the information available, the records available. So by that point, if we look at the start, we know that when these were democratized and made available, when they were de declassified, you're already 30 years behind on telling your own story, at which point a state has become very sophisticated, developed, militarily advanced, has developed, has an identity, has multiple generations born in that in that period of time. Um, and still we're not hearing within those 30 years anything from the Palestinian perspective other than cliched orientalist narratives of, you know, barbarity and, um, you know, they couldn't make the desert bloom and what have you. And since 1980 or 1984, which is roughly six years after the archives were declassified and Saeed quoted this, quite a bit of scholarship has, you know, has been published. Um, whereas perhaps in the 80s and 90s, you might have 10 or 15 books. Now you have, you need endless room on your shelves for all the content on, on Palestine and by extension, Israel-Palestine. And there's also the 
the generations that have now grown up in exile that have access or who are writing and have access to other languages and they're writing in English, they're writing in French and Spanish, Italian, Hebrew, and they're telling that same story in so many different languages. So they're internationalizing it and making it more accessible to more people. So yes, to put it simply, there's a lot more content now than say in 1984. But as we've seen with what happened with Norman Finkelstein and Stephen Salaita and even Mark Lemont Hill when he was fired from CNN for his UN speech uh, for Palestinians a few years ago, the apparatus is still there. And you still have to be careful about how you present the Palestinian perspective in, the, in, in your scholarship or in media because there is a chance that you will be punished for that. So, so it's a yes and no. Um, I think by and large, we've improved greatly because of also social media and platforms such as Netflix and Amazon democratizing access to these films that otherwise you couldn't see outside of a, a film festival and those kinds of things. Hmm. I think, and many critics though, I mean, if I was playing devil's advocate, I'd say, I'd say that you know, I'd point to the hundreds of books on the Nakba, um, thousands and thousands of um, pages of oral history about the ethnic cleansing of Palestinian villages, uh, and the many documentaries, a number of movies. I mean, we, there was The Promise, I think, in 2011. That was an interesting movie. I mean, you spoke about another pro um, movie called The Parrot in your article as well. Uh, and of course, there's a number of documentaries and videos out there on um, the horrific crimes that were perpetrated during the Nakba. Uh, so th there's a rich and vivid, you know, picture of what actually happened. So, you know, what are we, you as Palestinians, what, what, what are we complaining about when we uh, when we speak about an, an, an apparatus of suppression against Palestinians uh, speaking about their narrative and their story? It's a really good question, and I think one that needs to be answered, and I'll try my best to answer it. Um, so, I mean, yes, there's a, like I said, there's been, specifically since the late 1970s onwards, a vast archive that has been developed of documentary film, even propaganda film, um, maybe more localized Arab films and, and television series, as well as thousands of books at this stage about the Nakba and also about Palestine in general. But I think the main challenge remains that you have to know what Nakba is, what, what the Nakba was or is, because it's ongoing for many of us, uh, to even know where to start looking Right. And to know where, you know, if you want this perspective, who to who to read and who to look for. We have to we cannot underestimate that for many people, the 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 beginning, the starting point is the main challenge. And if the if you know, I'll speak for the United States, if the constant and common and prevailing narrative is one that is in favor of um the Zionist narrative at all costs, right? Then it's very hard actually what the mainstream is telling you. It's very hard to counter that and try to find another perspective if you don't know somebody who already knows something about it, right? And this is why a film on Netflix changes the scope of the conversation or the range of the conversation because anybody can search, do a search on Netflix and write Palestinian film and television and they will, they will give you the entire um, list right? The repertoire of what they have, and you can then choose. There's a question of choice. There's also the question of accessibility. And I would say that while there's a lot of academic work, that is not an accessible register for people, for most people, nor is it interesting, nor is it compelling in the same way that a film is, because a film offers aesthetics, it offers human representation, it offers you a story, as opposed to say, you know, a more historical or political account of an event, you see it through the human experience. And I think that's the difference. Hmm. Yeah, I mean, let's turn to the movie for now itself. Um, and the most controversial scene, um, mm -hmm. which is the execution of the uh, family by a number of um, Zionist paramilitary uh, uh, militias, Zionist militias, sorry. Uh, it's quite harrowing. I mean, I, I, I was shocked that it was actually portrayed in that way myself. I was I was shocked and I cover Palestine quite a lot. I speak about the issue a lot. Um, some out there may say, you know, how reliable is that? The depictions, those scenes, um, horrific as they are, how reliable are those scenes? Um, 
It depends on who you're asking, right? But if you're if you're looking at it from the archive, it's been documented in the archive that the paramilitary militia did carry out these types of executions, particularly in specific villages like the one Farhat hails from. And I think the most famous are Tantu, well, the most famous is Deri Asin and then Kufur Qasim and then um, other villages like Tantura. Um, and that is what kind of was the catalyst that, I don't want to say inspired, but let's say um, caused people to consider fleeing their homes because they were afraid. And Leila Abu Lughud, uh, a wonderful um, academic at Columbia University and daughter of Ibrahim Abu Lughud write, wrote in a book that she did on the Nekba in the early 2000s, that the main thing people were afraid of um, in these moments depicted in Farha wasn't necessarily their death, it was Sharaf al-Banat, the honor of their daughters. So they didn't want their daughters to be victims of sexual violence. Um, so, so we know that these atrocities did, did happen. And we know that those were the main things that um, kind of instilled a sense of fear in the Palestinians who fled. Uh, but, you know, it's not just Farha that, that discusses these things in passing. There's even a uh, Jean-Luc Carré novel that was adapted into a miniseries by Sundance Channel, and it, it stars Florence Pugh and Alexander Skarsgård and Michael Shannon. And that might be one of the first shows that I've watched that says, I mean, where the characters say, oh, you know, Deir Yassin, that was the, uh, you have a white British general type figure saying, Deir Yassin is the worst massacre I've ever seen in my life, you know? Um, and Alexander Skarsgård, who plays a Mossad agent in the in the show, also mentions this. So it's it's not uncommon knowledge, let's say. In terms of the representation and the discomfort it might elicit, I think that's, you know, that is every viewer is going to be uncomfortable whether you believe that this happened or you believe it didn't happen. And I think that that discomfort is probably something that attests to the artistic merits and also just the historical merits of this film also so it's it's tough i i know from the palestinian perspective that people millions of people six million people in the diaspora will tell you 110 percent this is this is this type of execution was witnessed by an ancestor of mine or a survivor of the neck of mine and and there will be people on the other end of the aisle that say, you know, this is blood libel and things like that. But I just want to conclude with one other point, which is there is a video going viral right now of testimonies from um, soldiers or uh, I guess we could call them soldiers from these paramilitary militia who are um, testifying that, yes, we did do this. And that I think that that probably got more <laughs> shares and views than the film Farha itself. So there are testimonials out there from, from the militia um, or members of those militia that have said, yeah, we did this. Yeah, I mean, I, I read a piece where um, one historian says that Farha is actually quite mild in comparison to what actually happened. And they point to the massacre in Tantura, and you met, mentioned that you seen as well. Uh, eyewitness account of former Israeli uh, fighters describing in harrowing details rape and you know a massacre uh, mm -hmm. carried out by their colleagues. Um, so yeah, I, I, th I think um, um, I'm not going to ask you, you know, whether you think it's um, uh, Farha is actually uh, mild in comparison, um, but I think that that view is out there. Uh, Farha is a, an accurate depiction um, by the account of Israeli soldiers themselves and of course from the Palestinian oral history itself and um, I think people need to find out more about it but what was interesting for me is the Israeli reaction to Farha and I think that, that's when I want to that's what I want to turn to now uh, it's been interesting to say the least watching you know people like um, Netanyahu other Israeli officials denouncing uh, the movie. Uh, are you worried that uh, they will be able to apply enough pressure on Netflix to take it down? Well, I think the good news is whether or not it's taken down. I think I'll start with this. It's going to get taken down eventually, whether through pressure or by you know the termination or the end of a licensing agreement, because it's not a Netflix original film, right? And no film, unless it's a Netflix original film, is going to stay on Netflix forever. <laughs> That's just how it works. But I think the good news is that if it's taken down because of pressure, that people already know about the film. And so 
it might mean that having access to it will be very difficult unless you get permission from the producers or or what have you, which I think some people will give you permission, viewing permissions and send you links if you're going to do an event or what or something of that nature. Um, but I think the the good news is that it's out there. People know about it. People are talking about it. And um, I think from that sense, it can't be unseen. Um, or the knowledge about the film can't be unseen. But it's, you know, and it's, if I may also point to the other film I spoke about in my article, Al Babbara or The Parrot, which is also a short by, uh, co directed by Darin Salam. That film is an incredible 18 minute <laughs> um, punch in the gut because it depicts also early ethnic relations in Israel between uh, Jews from the Eastern lands, as they put it, Mizrahim, and then the Ashkenazi. And the, the Nekba or the expulsion of Palestinians is subliminally framed within that film. And it's much more about elevating sort of Orientalist encounters in early, um, in, in, in nascent Israel, so to speak. Uh, but no one's talking about, you know, the diversity of the stories that she's telling. It's just mostly about this specific film. And, and this isn't her, this is her first full length feature, but it's not her first project. And I don't think it'll be the last. Yes. Yeah, so Finally, I mean, what are you expecting and hoping? Do you think um, uh, Farha will inspire, catalyze, inspire new generations of Palestinians to produce movies like this? I mean, you mentioned the parrot, uh, Farha is another one, um, where the Nakba seems to be happening at the background and the story is really how you connect emotionally to the uh, central character, in this case, Farha, and in the other cases is, is the parrot. Uh, it's a new way of telling the story of the Palestinian Nakba. Uh, mm -hmm. There aren't many around. Uh, so I'm, I'm just wondering, I mean, do you think um, this will catch on and more and more uh, Palestinians will pick up this genre and this way of telling uh, the Palestinian story? What do you hope for in, in, in relation to that mm -hmm. in the future? I think the good news is that there's Palestinians telling all kinds of stories. So whether it's related to the Nakba or dispossession or what I loved about Farha for me was actually the moments before the Nakba, which which showed a very normal, pastoral, serene, certainly not, you know, non-political. There were politics in the background, but it really centered Palestinians on their land living um, before this traumatizing event of loss. Um, but I think, you know, the newer generation is certainly moving they're going to narrate this, but they're also moving beyond this and telling different kinds of stories, whether it's about the occupation or whether it's about, you know, our humanness and how how we're we're beings that are very prismic. We have multi, we're multifaceted. It's not just about talking about our trauma, it's about talking about our humanity as well. And I think, you know, perhaps the Netflix show Mo is a great example of something that um refers to. Palestinian political trauma, but doesn't, is not cliched and it's limited representation. It's really showing this very dynamic person going through a very human, um, very universal struggle that's predominantly economic in the story of an immigrant who, or a refugee who, who's stateless, let's say, um, turned immigrant. And, you know, the Nakba features in that story subliminally, but it's not the center of that experience. So I think what we're if I were to venture, I guess I would say um, what we will see with the generations to come is something much more dynamic um, than just the Nakba, because we existed before, we existed during, and we're existing after. And the experience is evolving with that continuity. And I think that's a good thing. Mm. I agree with you on the last point and well, on all those points. And, and <laughs> I recommend Mo as well. It's on Netflix, I think six or seven episodes is really good. And as you said, the, the Nakba is at the background, but it's more of a comedy. Um, but there's a seriousness to it about how Palestinians were stateless, uh, trying to basically survive in the US and the trauma they go through. But it's done mm -hmm. in a very, very subtle way. Um, I want to thank you for joining us, uh, Shuda, and I want to encourage all our viewers to watch um, Farha on Netflix. Uh, it's um, an amazing movie, could be a documentary itself, you know, uh, based on a true story, of course. Uh, and so do check it out before it probably may get, you know, taken down, who knows, but use this opportunity to watch it and do more research around it. 
Uh, and finally, I want to you know, quickly thank um, Shuza and uh, uh, say goodbye to everyone, goodbye to you as well, and hope to see you again next time. Bye bye. Thank you. This was Middle East Monitor Conversations, brought to you by the Middle East Monitor in London. <laughs>